Hello and welcome to the News by Standards. Britain's most expensive seaside town is Silcom in Devon, with an average house price of more than £1.2 million in 2022, according to Halifax. Silcom overtook Sandbanks in Dorset, which was the priciest seaside spot in 2021. According to the bank's analysis, seven of the top ten most expensive seaside spots were in Devon and Cornwall. The least expensive seaside location was Greenock, Scotland, where the average house price was £97,608. The bank analysed house price data for 209 coastal locations across England, Wales and Scotland in the 12 months to December 2022. Sulkland's main attraction is the picturesque estuary that forms the town's extensive waterfront, making it a popular place for water activities. It is also favoured by ramblers who are drawn to the area's steep coastal paths. While it is rich in natural beauty, Sulkham does not function like a normal town, according to South Ham's District Council leader Judy Pearce. Miss Pearce, a Conservative councillor for Sulkham and Thurlston, said the high proportion of second homes in the town makes life quite difficult. She said the population surges from about 2,000 to more than 23,000 in the summer months. In the winter, the town is absolutely dead, she said. It's like a morgue. There is nobody around at all. The lifeblood of the town is stripped away. In a community, you have a lot of people doing voluntary jobs, but there just isn't the manpower in Sulcum. Many of the most expensive seaside locations in the Halifax analysis were found along the coastline of southern England, all areas popular with second homeowners. Back in 2012, the average house price in Sulcum at 558500 £138 was less than half the typical 2022 value. According to the Halifax study, the cost of coastal homes around the UK increased by 56% between 2012 and 2022, from £195,509 to £304,460. During the early months of the COVID pandemic, coastal and rural locations were particularly popular as house hunters looked for properties with more space. Other locations where house prices have at least doubled over the past decade, including Margate and Westgate, on sea in Kent. By the end of 2022, a home in Margate cost 109% more on average than it did in 2012, rising from £146,276 to £305,191. The average cost of a property in Westgate on sea doubled from £154,686 to £308,764. Kim Kinnard, Mortgages Director at Halifax, said owning a home by the sea was an aspiration for many, but this comes at a price in many locations and Britain's most expensive seaside spot, Sulcum in Devon, will set buyers back over £1.2 million on average. When we delve deeper into the cost of Britain's seaside homes, it's clear that there is a broad spectrum in house prices. She said second home ownership undoubtedly played a role in driving up house prices in desirable locations. While house prices in any location are driven by factors such as supply and demand and interest rates, there are also socio-economic factors at play. Some of these factors are more acute in Britain's coastal communities and many British towns most in need of investment also sit near the shore. Miss, Miss Pierce said that the council was fairly limited in what it could do to make homes more affordable in Sulcombe. She said new builds in the area had a residency condition, there were cash incentives for homeowners to downsize, and the council was building as many affordable homes as possible. The authority has also agreed to charge second homeowners double council tax if legislation is approved by parliament. Miss Pierce said of the measures, what we can do is drop in the ocean and that's the problem. Halifax uses land registry data covering England and Wales in addition to figures from the registers of Scotland for the study. The 10 most expensive seaside towns in Britain, according to the Halifax analysis, are Sulcum De in Devon, which is based in the southwest, at £1,244,025. Second is Sandbanks, Dorset, southwest, at £952,692. Third is Alderbur, Suffolk, in east of England, at £794,492. Fourth is Padstow in Cornwall, based in the southwest, at £790,000. £847. Fifth is Limington in Hampshire, southeast, at £663,474. Sixth is Yarmouth, Isle of Wight, based in the southeast, at £611,816. Seventh is Dartmouth, based in Devon, and the southwest, at £567,985. Eighth is Kingsbridge, Devon, based in the southwest, at £556,659. Ninth is Wadebridge in Cornwall, based in the southwest, at £548. £1,669. Tenth is Budlew Salterton in Devon, based in the southwest, at a cost of £537,681. The ten least expensive seaside towns in Britain, according to Halifax analysis, are Greenock in the Clyde, based in Scotland, at £97,608. Second is Girvan in Ayrshire in Scotland, at £105,410. Third is Millport in Ayrshire, based in Scotland, at £111,381. 
£1,000. Fourth is Inver Gordon Ross and Cromarty, based in Scotland, at £114,962. Fifth is Sol Coast Ayrshire, based in Scotland, at £116,414. Sixth is New Biggin by the Sea, Northumberland, based in North East, at £117,663. Seventh is Stanrea, Dumfries and Galloway, based in Scotland, at £117,884. Eighth is Wick Caithness, based in Scotland, at £124,857. Ninth is Thurso Caithness, based in Scotland, at £126,716. And tenth is Campbelltown, Argyle and Butte, based in Scotland, at £129,348. The ten seaside towns with the biggest increases between 2012 and 2022 are in first place, Sulcombe, based in Devon, in the southwest, with an increase of 123%. Second is Margate, based in Kent, in the southeast, at an increase of 109%. Third is Westgate on Sea, based in Kent, in the southeast, at an 100% increase. Fourth is Birchington, based in Kent, in southeast, increase of 98%. Joint fourth is Elderbur, Suffolk, based in the east of England, at 98% increase. Sixth is Deal in Kent, in the southeast, increasing of 97%. Joint sixth is Ramsgate, based in Kent, in the southeast, at an increase of 97%. Sixth is again is Yarmouth Isle of Wight, based in the southeast, of an increase of 97%. Ninth is Whitstable, based in Kent, in the southeast, increase of 95%. And joint tenth is Padstow, Cornwall, based in the southeast, and Burnham on Crouch, based in Essex, with an increase of 94%. Downing Street has conceded that new processes brought in after Brexit played a role in days of chaotic travel queues at Dover. Officials blamed the slowing border processing and more coaches than expected 12-hour queues for ferries from Dover. On Sunday, Suella Braverman said it would be unfair to view the delays as an effect Brexit, but the PM's spokesman said the government was in discussion to speed up new passport checks in France. Rishi Sunak's official spokesperson said a combination of factors were to blame for delays, including poor weather and the high volume of traffic. Asked whether Brexit was one of the factors, the spokesman noted French officials now manually inspected and stamped every passport as passengers left the UK, which required time. The spokesman has said, we recognise there are new processes in place. That's why authorities were given a long time to prepare for the new checks, including during the transition period, of course. And we are in discussion with our French counterparts about how we can further improve the flow of traffic. Delays to access ferries to France from Dover were first reported on Friday at night when the port declared a critical incident. Extra ferries that were laid on overnight on Saturday were not enough to prevent the queues at Dover increasing through much of Sunday. Officials have explained that long border processing times were partly to blame for delays, and ferry companies said bad weather had disrupted some journeys. The port said ferry companies received 15% more coach bookings for the Easter period than what had been expected, which takes longer to process than cars. Dover also faced enormous disruption ahead of the spring getaway last year, with thousands of lorries queuing to leave the country. However, Christine Dixon, director of Cranberry Coachways, said the situation was much worse than previous years. We have had delays before, but nothing at all like this, she told BBC Radio 4's PM programme. She added that coaches were booked 12 months in advance by holiday companies and the port should have known what to expect. Teacher Will Griswell waited at Dover for 40 hours with 67 teenagers and a coach heading on a school football trip to Costa Brava. We had heard a bit of the news that there might be queues and we had plenty of water and some crisps and bits and pieces on board, but there were a number of other coaches in the queues that didn't have anything. He added that that a nearby coffee shop had a constant queue of around an hour and a half. People were trying to get information, but there was no real information coming forward. Home Secretary Suella Braverman told the Sophie Ridge on the Sunday programme on Sky it would not be fair to view the delays as an adverse effect on Brexit. So Kia told LBC on Monday, of course Brexit has had an impact. There are more checks to be done. That doesn't mean that I'm advocating a reversal of Brexit. I'm not. I've always said there is no case now for going back in. He added, once we left, it was obvious that what had to happen at the border would change. Whichever way you voted, that was obvious. Whichever way you voted, you are entitled to have a government that recognises that and plans ahead. Alistair Carmichael, the Liberal Democrat spokesman for Home Affairs, accused the government of being in complete denial about the impact of their botched deal with Europe. Businesses and travellers are tied up in the reams of red tape, but ministers are refusing to lift a finger. It shows the Conservative Party is out of touch, out of excuses, and should be out of power. Men still earn more than women, according to data gathered by the BBC. Despite a continued push for equality, the wage difference is still 9.4%, the same level as in 2017 to 2018, when firms were forced to publish figures. The figure is based on the difference in pay between the middle-ranking women and the middle-ranking man, the so-called median pay gap. This is different to unequal pay, paying women less for the same work, which is illegal. By law, companies, charities and public sector departments of 250 employees 
or more must publish their gender pay gap figures on the gender pay gap service website. It's part of a government initiative to force businesses to be more transparent about pay. By Tuesday afternoon, 9,824 employers had reported. Romy Savova, chief executive of pension provider Pension B, said that the latest data was bad news and it was pretty astounding that the gender pay gap remained at the same level compared to five years ago. Ms. Savova told the BBC's Today programme that the main culprit for the difference was that major corporations were setting an ambitious target for getting women into senior positions. You can look around many rooms and still see that they are unequally filled and unequally represented. Banking and finance remain among the worst offenders, with women earning on average 22% less than their male colleagues. The industry has narrowed the gap by just 0.5 percentage points compared with five years ago. The construction sector, meanwhile, narrowed the gap by 2.7 percentage points, but it remained highly unequal, with the average woman earning 78 pence for each pound a man earned. There are some businesses that pay women more than men, including Airbus operations at 17.7%, Azebra pay at 16.9%, and DHL services at 12%. But for many sectors, the gender pay gap has continued to widen. For example, in education, it increased by 0.9 percentage points. Jemima Olchowski, chief executive at the Fawcett Society, said all employers needed to create an action plan which set out how they will improve gender equality in their workplace. Reporting is a good way of identifying pay inequalities, but taking action is key, she said. Large businesses that have some of the widest gaps in pay between men and women include EasyJet, Lloyds Bank Division and Savills. At EasyJet, despite an improvement from last year, the average woman takes home just 53 pence for every one pound earned by a man. Mona Abdelati, a pilot for EasyJet, said that part of the challenge is more men than women are interested in professions like hers. For most people, when they see a female pilot, it's like a huge deal. She acknowledged the training was an investment. What I would say is that unless you love it, don't make the investment, just because it is so much money. The husband of former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has been arrested in connection with an investigation into Scottish National Party finances. Peter Morell, aged 58, is being questioned after being taken into police custody on Wednesday morning. Police Scotland said officers were carrying out searches at a number of addresses as part of the investigation. Mr Morell resigned as the party's chief executive last month, a post he had held since 1999. He has been married to Miss Sturgeon since 2010. Miss Sturgeon stood down as first minister last month and was last week succeeded by Hamza Yusuf. The new first minister said it was a difficult day for the SNP. Mr Yusuf said, I obviously can't comment on a live police investigation. What I will say is that the SNP has fully cooperated with the investigation and it will continue to do so. He added that the party had agreed to carry out a review on governance and transparency. There has been police activity at Mr Murrell and Miss Sturgeon's home in Glasgow and at SNP headquarters in Edinburgh. At about 10am there were 10 uniformed officers stationed outside the couple's detached property along with three police vehicles. The house was sealed off with blue and white tape and a tent was erected on the front lawn. The police presence increased during the search activity was extended to the garage and back guard. The curtains and blinds remained drawn and there was no sign of anyone in the property. Meanwhile, two officers were posted outside SNP HQ and there were others inside. At least six marked police vehicles were parked outside the building and officers carrying green crates and other equipment were seen going inside. In July 2021, Police Scotland launched a formal investigation into the SNP's finances after receiving complaints about how donations were used. Questions had been raised about funds given to the party for use in a fresh independence referendum campaign. Seven people made complaints and a probe was set up following talks with prosecutors. Miss Sturgeon, then First Minister and SNP leader, had insisted that she was not concerned about the party's finances. She said every penny of cash raised in online crowdfunding campaigns would be spent on the independent drive. Nicola Sturgeon gave multiple reasons for her resignation, but the police investigation into her party finances was not one of them. When they were asked about on the day she stood down, she declined to comment but would later insist it had not been a factor. They still wonder if it may have influenced the timing of her departure because her husband's arrest would be much more awkward for her if she was still in office as SNP leader and first minister. Police inquiries have been underway for about 18 months and were triggered when questions were raised about how more than £600,000 raised for independence campaigning had been spent when there had not been an independence referendum for it to be spent on. The SNP has previously said that it always intended to spend an equivalent sum in that way. Some weeks ago, the investigation reached a crucial stage when officers consulted the Crown Office on how to proceed. It is now much clearer what direction they received from those who oversee criminal investigations in Scotland. According to a statement, the SNP raised a total of £666,953 through referendum-related appeals between 2017 and 2020. The party pledged to spend these funds on the independence
Confidence campaign. Questions were raised after its accounts showed it had just under £97,000 in the bank at the end of 2019, and total net assets of about £272,000. Last year, it emerged Mr. Murrell gave a loan of more than £100,000 to the SNP to help it out with a cash flow issue after the last election. The then SNP's chief executive loaned the party £107,620 in June 2021. The SNP had repaid about half of the money by October of that year. At the time, an SNP spokesman said the loan was a personal contribution made by the chief executive to assist with cash flow after the Holyrood election. He said it had been reported in the party's 2021 accounts, which were published by the Electoral Commission in August last year. Weeks earlier, MP Douglas Chapman had resigned as party treasurer, saying he had not been given the financial information to do the job. Mr. Murrell resigned last month after taking responsibility for misleading statements about a fall in party membership. The number of members had fallen from the 104,000 it had two years ago to just over 72,000. An SNP spokesperson said clearly it would not be appropriate to comment on any live police investigations, but the SNP has been fully cooperating with this investigation and will continue to do so. At its meeting on Saturday, the governing body of the SNP, the NEC, agreed to a review of governance and transparency. That will be taken forward in the coming weeks. Scottish Labour leader Anas Sawar told BBC Scotland it was an extremely serious situation and that the police investigation must be allowed to proceed without interference. He added that there are huge questions I think to answer for both Hamza Yusuf and Nicholas Sturgeon about what they knew and when. Scottish Conservative constituency spokesman Donald Cameron said senior SNP politicians, including Nicholas Sturgeon and Hamza Yusuf, must cooperate fully with the investigation into this very serious case and commit to openness and transparency. Alba leader Alex Salmond, who preceded Ms Sturgeon as First Minister as SNP leader, told BBC Scotland, I led the SNP for a long time. I'm very sad about what's happening to it and indeed about what it has come to. Scottish police normally have 12 hours to question a suspect after their arrest. At some point, the detectives will decide whether or not to charge Peter Morrell. Given the nature of the case, he is expected to be released from custody either way. The police will then send a report to Scotland's Prosecution Service, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, COPFS, which will decide what happens next. It will consider whether there is enough evidence to prove that a crime has taken place, whether the suspect was the perpetrator, and if it is in the public interest, prosecute. The COPFS Prosecution Code says a fundamental principle of the process is that decisions on individual cases are immune from political influence or other pressures. Prosecutors are required to carry out their duties without fear, favour or prejudice. L'Oreal has agreed to buy Australian skincare brand ASOP in a deal worth $2.53 billion or £2 billion, the French beauty giant's largest takeover in decades. The brand is a superb combination of urbanity, hedonism and undeniable luxury, L'Oreal chief executive Nicholas Heronimus said. Since its founding 36 years ago, ASOP has developed a cult of following around the world for its products, including soaps, lotions and creams. ASOP has almost 400 stores globally. The deal, which is subject to regulatory approvals, is expected to close in the third quarter of this year. Mr. Hieronymus said that L'Oreal will help ASOP expand in China, where it opened its first store in 2022. ASOP taps into all of today's ascending currents, and L'Oreal will contribute to unleash its massive potential, notably in China and travel retail, he added. Brazilian cosmetics company Natura & Co. bought a majority stake in ASOP in 2012, before taking full ownership of the brand four years later. It became Natura's highest revenue earner over the decade between 2012 and 2022. ASAP gross sales jumped from $28 million to $537 million during the period. ASAP was founded in 1987 by hairdresser Dennis Pafitis, who had started blending essential oils into products at his salon in Melbourne, Australia. As demand grew, he developed samples for customers. Mr. Pafitis eventually named his brand after the famous Greek fabulist and storyteller ASAP. Natura chief executive Fabio Barbosa said the company would now focus improving its other businesses, including the UK high street chain The Body Shop, which it bought from L'Oreal in 2017. We are confident that Aesop's growth story will continue under the ownership of L'Oreal and wish Aesop continued success in this new chapter, Mr. Barbosa added. A UK government announcement on plans to impose consistent waste collection rules in England has been delayed until after the upcoming local elections. Under the reforms, councils could be required to collect six different types of recyclable waste separately. The new policy was due to be made public last month, almost two years after the launch of consultation on waste consistency. Councils had warned the changes could prove costly, chaotic and unworkable, but the government argues that standardisation will make recycling easier, increasing recycling rates and help eliminate avoidable waste by 2050. We have held a public consultation on the proposed changes and will announce further details soon. A spokesperson for 
Health Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, said. The BBC was told the details of the waste overhaul had almost been finalised, but there was not enough time to make the announcement ahead of the local elections in May. Government guidance says there may be cases when it is better to delay policy announcements that could have a political influence during a pre-election period. The Labour leader of Cheshire East Council, Sam Corcoran, said he feared the announcement had been delayed because the government realised how unpopular the changes will be and are seeking to implement them after the elections. The proposals should be scrapped completely, Mr Cochran said. Green Party co-leader Adrian Ramsey said local authorities have waited years for an agreed approach to collecting recyclable waste. Further delays shows yet again that this government is dodging action, afraid of upsetting Conservative councils and not treating this critical environmental issue with the priority needed. Conservative MP Sir Robert Goodwill, chairman of the DEFRA Parliamentary Committee, said the policy announcement may have been delayed for practical reasons, such constraints on government time ahead of the elections. But he said ministers should think it through, given the initial local reaction from local authorities. Adding, I don't think they've listened to industry enough. The government has been working out how these waste reforms would work in practice since the Environment Act became law in 2021. The Act requires the collection of six recyclable waste streams from households, including plastics, metal, glass, paper and card, food waste and garden waste. In theory, that would mean separate bins for each type of waste. There will be a duty for councils to collect the recyclable waste streams separately unless it is not technically or economically practical or there is no significant environmental benefit in doing so. Under the plans, councils will also need to collect food waste weekly as well as offer a basic free service to remove garden waste. The new policies will not apply in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland where devolved administrations decide how to manage their waste. The delay has put many councils in a period of stasis, said Charlotte Payne, the head of operational services at the Conservative controlled South Island Council in Lincolnshire. She said there was concern that when the response is released, the timetable for delivery will not have altered and could create an impossible situation to conceive of delivering a whole new service. The Chartered Institute of Waste Management, CIWM, which represents professionals in the industry, said the uncertainty made it difficult for its members to prepare for the significant changes these reforms will bring. The resources and waste sector is geared up and ready to push ahead with these policies reforms as we can see the benefits they will bring but we need the starting gun to be fired first. Lee Marshall, policy director at CIWM, said councils are particularly worried the reforms will make it more difficult to collect recyclable waste in one bin or bag, a practice known as co-mingling. In a system of co-mingled recycling, dry and clean materials such as glass, metal, paper and plastics can be put in one bin and collected by a single lorry. Six of the top 10 recycling councils have co-mingled waste according to analysis by the district council's network, a lobby group. This suggests that existing collection systems are producing the strongest results. Three Rivers District Council in Hertfordshire, which has a co-mingling system, came top with a recycling league table in 2021 to 2022. The council's Liberal Democrat leader, Sarah Nels, said the government's reforms could reduce local freedom to deliver services that are already effective. Any further delay makes this even harder and forces councils to wait even longer before they can take decisions on how best to improve services. Miss Nelm said, after two years of limbo, we need clarity urgently. Media watchdog Ofcom has launched an investigation into whether a GB news programme hosted by two Conservative MPs broke impartiality rules. There have been 39 complaints about an edition of Esther McVeigh and Philip Davies show on the 11th of March. In it, the pair interviewed Chancellor Jeremy Hunt about his budget. Ofcom said it would examine whether it complied with rules about politicians presenting programmes and whether it included a sufficient range of views. GB news has not committed on the investigation. Ofcom's rules say politicians are not allowed to be newsreaders, interviewers or reporters in news programmes unless exceptionally it is editorially justified. However, they are allowed to host current affairs shows as long as a range of views are reflected. Whether Saturday morning with Esther and Philip qualifies as a news or current affairs programme and whether a broad enough range of opinions was included is likely to be central to Ofcom's eventual ruling. That will be the question whether or not it is a news programme or whether or not it is a wider opinion and a current affairs show. Ofcom Chief Executive Dame Melanie Dawes told a parliamentary committee on the 14th of March. SNP MP John Nicholson, a member of the DCMS committee, told her he thought it broke the rules. It is a news programme, obviously, he said. Two MPs are interviewing on the news channel, a Tory chancellor, about the news. That is a news interview, it's not a cooking programme. The interview was broadcast four days before Mr Hunt delivered his budget. Announcing its investigation on Monday, an Ofcom spokesman said, we are investigating whether this programme broke our rules, requiring news and current affairs to be presented with due impartiality. Our investigation will look at the program's compliance with our rules on politicians presenting programs and whether it included an appropriately wide range of significant views relating to a matter of major political controversy or current public policy. Also on Monday, Ofcom decided
decided not to launch an investigation into an interview with Nadine Norris, another sitting MP, with former Prime Minister Boris Johnson on rival channel Talk TV on the 3rd of February. We concluded that the programme was a non-news programme and therefore could be presented by a politician and adequately reflected alternative viewpoints and provided sufficient context, Ofcom said. The brother of television presenter Philip Schofield has been found guilty of sexually abusing a boy. Timothy Schofield, age 54, from Bath, denied 11 sexual offences involving a child between October 2016 and October 2019. Schofield, who was a civilian worker for Avon and Somerset Police at the time of the offences, was found guilty of all charges. Philip Schofield said after the verdict, as far as I'm concerned, I no longer have a brother. The jury at Exeter Crown Court found him guilty with a majority of 10 to 2 after more than five and a half hours deliberating. In a statement released by his lawyer, Philip Schofield said his brother had committed a despicable crime. My overwhelming concern is and has always been for the well-being of the victim and his family. I hope that their privacy will now be respected. During the trial, Timothy Schofield denied performing sexual acts on the boy, but admitted he had watched pornography with a teenager and they had an action while sitting apart. The jury previously heard how he had confessed to his TV star brother in September 2021 about watching pornography with a teenager on one occasion, claiming it happened after the boy was 16, the age of consent. Philip Schofield described it in a written statement read to the court how his brother had phoned him in an agitated and upset state, and Mr. Schofield had invited him to drive to his home in London. He told how his brother said, you are going to hate me for what I'm about to say, with him assuring him there was nothing he could say that would do that. Mr. Schofield said in statement, then he said that he and the boy had time together and that last year they had watched something together. I turned and said, what did you just say? He said it was just last year and we were alone together. Tim said it was just this one time. I told him it should never happen again. He then started to tell me about the boy's body. He told him to stop. I shouted at Tim that he had to stop. I didn't want to know any of the details, but he made it sound like a one-off. I said, I don't want you to tell me anymore. They said, you've got to stop. Just never do it again. Regardless how that happened, it must never happen again. The this morning presenter's statement issued after the guilty verdict on Monday said, if any crime had ever been confessed to me by my brother, I would have acted immediately to protect the victim and their family, adding that he welcomed the guilty verdicts. Robin Shellard, prosecuting, told the court the boy's evidence showed the abuse in fact began when he was aged 13. Timothy Schofield has been remanded in custody and will be sentenced at Bristol Crown Court on the 19th of May. His employer in Avon and Somerset Police said it would now start misconduct proceedings against him. Schofield was suspended from duty in December 2021 when the criminal proceedings started. Senior Investigating Officer Detective Inspector Keith Smith said Schofield has exploited and abused the victim by carrying out a sickening series of offence over a significant period of time. Although the defender does not work in a public facing role and the offences are not linked to his employment, we know the fact he works for the police will be a matter of public concern. Schofield was convicted of three counts of causing a child to watch sexual activity, three of engaging in sexual activity in the presence of a child, three of causing a child to engage in sexual activity, and two of sexual activity with a child. The victim told the jury he felt emotionally blackmailed by Timothy Schofield and forced to participate in sexual activity. He said, I felt that emotionally there was no escape from what we had to do and I felt that there was a tremendous amount of pressure and expectation for me to fulfil what was being asked and wanted. An NSPCC spokesperson said Schofield's actions were deeply harmful. They added, child sexual abuse can have devastating and long-lasting impact on a person's life. We hope that the young man he targeted is receiving all the support he needs to move forward with his life. Montana Brown has shared plans to be more vigilant about after she discovered that an air tag has been slipped into a bag while jetting off on holiday. Appearing on the Good Morning Britain today, the pregnant Love Island star, age 27, recalled the terrifying moment she emptied out her bag and felt the tag. She told hosts Kate Garraway and Richard Maidley, I was travelling to LA on my own just to see some friends and it was only when I landed and I had a notification that popped up on my iPhone and it said your location is being tracked by an air tag. And I think initially I was like, oh, it's probably someone one's air tag nearby because obviously everybody uses them to track their luggage anyway. Montana's partner then suggested that she should check in her bag just in case, which the TV star says she was brushing off at the time and thinking that was probably nothing. It was only when they went to the bathroom and emptied out everything out of the bag that was at the bottom of the bag, Montana continued. So that was really alarming because I generally had no idea that somebody was even that close to me to be able to put it in my bag. Asked by Richard if she had ever any idea who put the tag in her bag, and when Montana replied, so it does give you a time frame on the notification. It says it was put on you at this time. So it was about an eight hour flight. So it was just before then. So it could have been at the airport or at check-in or as soon as I got on the flight. She then revealed that having not had anything like this happened in the past, Montana presumes that it was a stranger that placed the tag in her bag, adding that they could
couldn't be tracked down as she had panicked and flushed the tag in the bathroom upon discovering it. When asked if it had made her more aware of her belongings, Montana bowed to be more vigilant when out and about, adding, absolutely, I still am really baffled how someone managed to literally get that close proximity without me noticing. Reflecting further on the scary ordeal, she said it definitely was a shocking experience because you kind of like go down a rabbit hole of what would they then have done next and what would they have tracked my location for. Montana's appearance on GMB came just days after the mum-to-be had a terrifying hospital dash when reduced movement sparked cause for concern. She later gave fans an update from hospital revealing that she'd been checked over and everything was okay. Hollywood star Leonardo DiCaprio has testified in the trial of ex fugies rapper Pras Michel, who is accused of accepting money from fugitive tycoon to influence US politicians. Mr. Michel, aged 50, allegedly received more than $100 million or £80 million from Malaysian billionaire Joe No. He denies a slew of charges, including conspiracy and witness tampering. Mr. DiCaprio, age 48, who is not accused of wrongdoing in the case, was asked to testify about his links to Mr. Lowe. Mr. Lowe is alleged to have stolen billions from Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund in the 1MDB scheme, the biggest embezzlement case in history. According to federal prosecutors, Mr. Michelle was being paid to bring a secret illegal foreign influence to bear on US politics. Mr. Michelle is accused of making illegal contributions to Barack Obama's 2012 US presidential campaign using an illegal network of third parties paid with foreign funds. Prosecutors believe Mr. Lowe also wanted to use Mr. Michelle to lobby Trump administration officials to abandon their investigation into Mr. Lowe's alleged role in the 1MDB scheme. Mr. Michelle and Mr. Lowe are both facing charges in the case, but only Mr. Michelle is appearing in court. Mr. Lowe is currently at large and believed to be in China. Prosecutors say the financier used his vast resources to curry favour with celebrities including Mr. DiCaprio and model Miranda Kerr. Mr. Lowe's parties also drew the likes of Alicia Keys, Harris Hilton and Britney Spears. Spears once jumped out of a cake to wish Mr. Lowe a happy birthday. In the Washington DC court on Monday, a soft-spoken bearded Mr. DiCaprio testified about his financial ties with Mr. Lowe. Mr. DiCaprio, who described himself simply as an actor, told jurors he first met Mr. Lowe at a party in Las Vegas in 2010. In subsequent years, he attended a multitude of lavish parties on yachts and nightclubs at Mr. Lowe's invitation, alongside other celebrities, actors and musicians. On one occasion, Mr. DiCaprio attended a New Year's Eve party in Australia with Mr. Lowe, after which party goes were flown to the US in an effort to celebrate Mr. New Year's twice. The actor's 2013 film Walk for Wall Street about a notorious fraudster was partially funded by a firm tied to Mr. Lowe. I understood him to be a huge businessman with many connections, Mr. DiCaprio told the court. He was a prodigy in the business world and ultra successful. US District Judge Colleen Collar Cotelli more than once asked the actor to keep his voice up so he could be heard by the jury and court reporter. Mr. Michelle looked at the actor and waved when Mr. DiCaprio was asked to identify him in court. Bloomberg previously reported that Mr. Lowe was especially generous with Mr. DiCaprio and did a $3.2 million work of art by Picasso to his charity in addition to a $9.2 million piece on Jean-Michel Bisquet. Mr. DiCaprio reportedly later turned those items and others received from Mr. Lowe over to authorities. On one day, the actor said that Mr. Lowe also actively participated in auctions held by Mr. DiCaprio in Saint-Tropez to bring in funds for his environmentally focused foundation. Later in their relationship, Mr. DiCaprio said the two men began discussing US politics with Mr. Lowe expressing an interest in making a significant contribution of between $20 million and $30 million to the Democratic Party ahead of the 2012 presidential election. I basically said, wow, that's a lot of money, Mr. DiCaprio said. Authorities believe these funds were embezzled from 1MDB. Mr. DiCaprio did not accuse Mr. Michel of wrongdoing in his testimony. He said that he first met Mr. Michel in the 1990s following a Fugees concert. He added that Mr. Michel might have also attended a Thanksgiving party at its home, although memory does not serve and he could not say for sure. In 2019, Mr. DiCaprio reportedly testified before a grand jury in Washington, D.C. as part of the Justice Department's investigation into the 1MDB scheme. Mr. DiCaprio told jurors that he lost contact with Mr. Lowe around 2015 after being informed that he was under investigation for his financial dealings. The Oscar winner may not be the only celebrity to testify in Pras Michel's trial. During the jury selection, attorneys named actors including Jim Carrey, Jamie Foxx and Mark Wahlberg as possible witnesses, in addition to director Martin Sorsese, according to CNN. The swollen case could also see testimony from former high-level U.S. government officials and political insiders, including Donald Trump's former chief strategist Steve Bannon and Rudy Giuliani, a former mayor of New York and previously a lawyer for Mr. Trump. WWE and owners of mixed martial arts franchise UFC are to form a new £17.3 billion sports 
sports entertainment brand. The publicly traded company will see UFC owners and Dever Group Holdings taking a 51% controlling interest and existing WWE shareholders 49%. The business will be led by Endeavor Chief Executive Ari Emanuel. WWE Executive Chairman Vince McMahon will fill the same role at the company with Dana White remaining Ultimate Fighting Championship President. Mr. McCone retired last year following misconduct claims but returned to the WWE board in January and suggested the company could be for sale. This is a rare opportunity to create a global live sports and entertainment pure play built for where the industry is headed, said Emmanuel. For decades, Vince and his team have demonstrated an incredible track record of innovation and shareholder value creation, and we are confident that Endeavor can deliver significant additional value for shareholders by bringing UFC and WWE together. WWE has a global reach and fan base, which includes a wide age demographic and range of out of incomes. The company had more than 16 billion social media video views in the quarter in the final quarter of 2022. It has daily 94 million YouTube subscribers and more than 20 million followers on TikTok. Five of its female wrestlers are in the world's top 15 most followed female athletes across Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, led by former UFC fighter Ronda Rousey with 36.1 million followers. Virgin Media O2 says it has restored broadband for its customers after thousands in the UK reported they were unable to access the internet. Down Detector, which tracks websites, showed more than 26,000 people reported their home broadband was not functioning on Tuesday morning. It came as Virgin contacted customers to advise them of price increases, averaging at a 13.8% higher bill. The firm apologised for inconvenience caused by the outage. It had previously told customers it was aware of an issue with broadband services for Virgin Media and was working to identify and fix the problem as quickly as possible. Virgin has around 5.8 million home broadband users across the UK, according to its latest figures. Like other internet suppliers, Virgin is raising its prices from April 2023 for existing customers. It is also changing the terms of its contracts to bring it in line with most other suppliers, which increase the cost of broadband contracts by the Consumer Prices Index CPI or Retail Prices Index RPI measures of inflation plus nearly 4%, meaning some services are increasing monthly bills by 17.3%. The problem did not affect Virgin's television service. The outage began overnight on the 4th of April, according to Down Detector, with 40,000 people reporting problems at 2 a.m. British Standard Time. By 8 a.m., just under 26,000 people told the website they could not access their broadband, but by the afternoon, the number of reports had decreased. The actual number of people who were affected by the outage is unclear, as users must have an additional way to access the internet, such as a mobile device with 4G, in order to report the problem. Virgin's website was also inaccessible at 8 a.m., meaning customers could not use its status checker, which advises users on the connectivity status of their broadband, television, and phone line. But by 10 a.m., this had been resolved. The first glimpse of the coronation invitation shows the official use of Queen Camilla, marking the transition from the title of Queen Consort. The ornately illustrated invitation sent to around 2,000 guests is from King Charles III and Queen Camilla. Her grandchildren will be among the pages at Westminster Abbey alongside the King's grandson, Prince George. With a month to go before the coronation, a new official photo of the royal couple has also been released. The invitation for the 6th of May coronation, printed on the side of paper, shows the coronation will mark a change in how Camilla is titled. A royal source suggested that in the initial part of the new reign, it made sense to use Queen Consort as a way of distinguishing her from the late Queen Elizabeth. But from the coronation, it would be an appropriate time to officially change to Queen Camilla. At the coronation service next month, Camilla will be crowned alongside the King 18 years after the couple married. And it's not much more than a year since the late Queen Elizabeth had addressed what was still the unresolved question of Camilla's future title. The late Queen had given a public endorsement for Camilla, saying she should be called Queen Consort at a time when there were still suggestions that she would be known as a Princess Consort. Reflecting the King's many years of environmental campaigning, the artwork for the coronation invitation uses the folklore figure of the Green Man with features made from ivy, hawthorn and oak leaves. According to Buckingham Palace, it is a symbol of spring and rebirth which celebrates a new reign. Design by illustrator Andrew Jameson also includes images of the natural world including wildflowers, birds and insects as well as national and heraldic emblems. But with the coronation approaching, it is still not clear whether the invitation for Prince Harry and Meghan, Duchess of Sussex, is going to be accepted. The spokesperson for the Californian-based couple said this week there was no update on whether they were attending. President Joe Biden, who will not be attending, told the King by phone on Tuesday that First Lady Jill Biden would represent the US at the event the White House has confirmed. The President also conveyed his desire to meet with the King in the United Kingdom at a future date, a statement added. Last week, the King completed his first state visit, receiving a warm welcome in Germany. But the focus is now on preparations for the coronation. Ross have been given to children of friends and relations with eight pages of honour announced to take part in the ceremony. 
This includes Prince George, the nine-year-old son of the Prince and Princess of Wales, and three of the Queen Consort's grandchildren, Gus and Louis Lopes, Freddie Parker Bowles, and her great-nephew, Arthur Elliot. The new official photograph of the King and the Queen Consort was taken last month in the Blue Drawing Room in Buckingham Palace. It follows an announcement by the Cabinet Office of another photo of the King, with public places such as council offices, courts, police stations, and schools being invited to apply for a framed photograph of King Charles. But anti-monarchy campaigners criticised the £8 million budget for the new pictures, saying that it was a waste of public money at a time of funding pressures. The Cabinet Office would not be giving a breakdown of the contract for the framed photos, but said details would be announced in due course. It is also understood that there will be no overall figure for government spending on a coronation until after the event. This year's Electronic Entertainment Expo, the annual video game showcase known as E3, has been cancelled. It was due to return as an in-person event in Los Angeles for the first time in four years in June, but will not run in person or online. Analysts say it has struggled to remain relevant and adapt to changes in the industry in recent years. Ubisoft became the latest publisher to pull out, while Nintendo, Microsoft and Sony were reportedly set to miss it. Ubisoft told Video Game Chronicle it would livestream its own showcase instead of attending E3. Since 1995, the event operated by the Entertainment Software Association, ESA, has gathered video game developers, publishers, bands and media from across the world to help hype hotly anticipated game and console launches. Some large publishers have started hosting their own online events, tease new titles and tech alongside instead of gathering at an event like this with their competitors. The console manufacturers have been a focal point in previous E3s, with seismic product reveals including the Xbox 360, PlayStation 4 and Nintendo DS. E3 in the past at its peak was an attack on the senses. There were neon lights, actors dressed up as video game characters strolling around giant halls, fans taking selfies by big statues and people handing out t-shirts and encouraging you to try out their games. It was so loud with music blaring from every booth. It was different when it created a buzz and atmosphere of excitement that the games industry hasn't matched since. Leading developers in the past told them it was such an important event because it provided a week in the spotlight for the games industry. When Keanu Reeves came out on stage as a few years ago to announce that he was going to be in Cyberpunk 2077, it was a moment everybody talked about and gave. that's what E3 gave you. It has also brought the global games industry together and that's had a big spillover for smaller developers. If a stand was next door to Nintendo's presenting something like a new Mario game, people would check you out too. Individual companies will still have events with PlayStation, Nintendo and Ubisoft hosting their own shows, but it's never the same because those companies are often speaking to people already converted to their products. What E3 gave companies was an opportunity to cut through to new audiences and different people and that could be lost. The long term impact is unclear but some people will certainly be mourning the loss of E3 this year. That's not to say it won't come back eventually but we must wait to see if it does and if it ever reaches its former peak. A notice on E3's website says its organisers Readpop and the ESA will reevaluate the future of E3 but Readpop has said they will still work together on future events. Gaming news site IGN and it said ESA members, which include Nintendo Electronic Arts, Epic Games, and Microsoft, have been informed of the cancellation by an email, which said this year's event had not attracted enough suitable interest. Carl Mushdi Cash, Reed Pop's global vice president of gaming, said it was a difficult decision, but they had to do what was right for the industry. Piers Harding Rolls, video game industry analyst at MP Analysis, analysis told BBC News the cancellation reflected the declining relevance of a huge in-person trade show in the middle of June. He added that the event has struggled to remain relevant and reinvent itself. In line with industry changes, including the growth of mobile gaming and the rise of more frequent digital only showcases live streamed online. Same Austin, the legendary New York music executive who signed Madonna, Talking Heads, The Ramones, and many more, has died at the age of 80. Stein set up record label Sire in 1966 and became a key figure in the punk, new wave, and pop scenes. He introduced UK acts like The Smiths, Fleetwood Mac, The Peachy Mode, Seal, The Cure, and Madness to the US. The music he brought to the world impacted so many people's lives in a positive way, his daughter Mandy said. One of the most successful talent swatters in the business, his other signings included Ice-T, The Pretenders, KD Lang and Richard Hell and the Boy Doids. Stein got into the music industry at the age of just 13 in the 1950s, when he persuaded industry paper the award to let him have a desk in his office. He would go there after school, copying their charts from the previous 20 years into a notebook and educating himself by working his way through bound back issues. At school, he listened to music on a portable radio in class, convincing teachers it was a hearing aid and it was slightly deaf. When rock and roll came in, I was part of it right at the ground floor, Steiner told BBC News in 2008. I was blown away and it took over my life. After choosing a job with Billboard over university, Steiner joined King Records, which launched James Brown
Khan's career before working for songwriters and producers Jeremy Leiber and Mike Stoller in the Brill Building, the hub of the New York music industry. He started Sire with songwriter Richard Grosier with its tennis ball S logo. Sire made its name in the 1970s after Stein signed the group that are widely regarded as the first punk band. Stein had arranged to see the Ramones in 1975 but fell deathly ill so sent his wife Linda a teacher instead. She came back raving, he said. I just drank so much chicken soup that I was unable to go down the next day and hire a little studio for an hour to hear them perform. In 15 minutes it was all over. They must have played about 15 or 18 songs in that short space of time. Everyone was awed by their demeanour but to me it was the songs I heard great melodies. It was at a Ramones gig at that Stein chanced upon another great New York band. I got goosebumps all over. He recalled of seeing Talking Heads for the first time. I stood there frozen and when they finished I jumped up on stage and helped them with their equipment. I tried to sign them immediately but it was the longest courtship ever at Sire Records. They eventually signed 11 and a half months later. Stein himself claimed to have coined the term a new wave but his greatest coup came in 1982 where a DJ called Mark Kamins suggested he listen to a new singer called Madonna. Stein was recovering from a heart infection at the time. I was in the hospital. I had her come to see me in the hospital. He said we talked a deal in the hospital and we all we did the deal in the hospital. Within days even before they got out of the hospital she was starting to record what came her first single Everybody and We Were Off and Running. Madonna's desire to succeed clinched it with Stein. He said writing on Instagram following the news of his death Madonna described Stein as one of the most influential men in her life. I saw her staunch determination and I knew she would work as hard as I did and much harder in fact and that's what you need in an artist. She worked harder than anybody. Stein was a lover of UK music and was a partner on Fleetwood Mac's first label Blue Horizon and signed licensing deals with UK labels like Rough Trade and Creation. He snapped up the Smiths after a gig at the ICA in London. I signed the band right after the show before I even cleaned away the glad delays I had been pelted with from the stage by Morrison. In the notes of the 2006 Sire box set, guitarist Johnny Marr recalled he was one of the only people in the whole of the States who got it. We wanted to be on Sire. The PC Mode singer Dave Gahan wrote, he had the courage to sign the type of bands that I grew up listening to when everyone else was scared and baffled. Echo and the Bunnymans Ian McCulloch said Stein had the best taste and ears I've ever seen. I've ever known. While creation founder Alan McGee said he was my role model in the music business. In 2005, Stein was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which held his ability to hear the future. Introducing him on stage at that ceremony, Ice-T said, when you take the mighty lemon drops, the Ramones, Madonna, Talking Heads, the Pichy Mode, Ministry, Ice-T, you put them together, it doesn't seem like they go together. But they do, they all had an edge, that's what Samer was into. KSI has visited a mosque and spoke to an imam days after he used a racial slur in a YouTube video. In the now deleted YouTube clip with his group The Sidemen, he created the four letter derogatory word for people of South Asian origin during a countdown challenge. He then tweeted an apology saying there was no excuse. The rapper, whose real name is Jide William Olatunji, went to the Al Hikam Institute in Bradford on Tuesday. The 29 year old was pictured wearing a red covering during the visit listening to Imam Mohammed Asim Hussein. Videos of KSI meeting those at the mosque have been viewed millions of times on social media with some praising the visit. The least he can do is face up to his mistakes and educate himself, one person posted. Others doubted his motive, with one Twitter user writing he was there because he's been advised by his PR team for damage limitation to preserve his brand. In the clip, the Imam can be heard saying, with the intention of malice, even those probably sat on the side, they probably didn't understand, they might have just been like laughed off. He is here to learn about what it is he's never been in a mosque. The YouTuber turned boxer also announced he was taking a social media break when he apologised on Monday. I've all said to my audience that they shouldn't worship me or put me on a pedestal because I'm human. Kirsai found fame with the Simon and is regularly involved in sketches on their YouTube channel, which is more than 18 million subscribers. In March 2021, Kirsai apologised for previously using transgender slurs, saying he honestly didn't even know they were slurs. I know now though. John Lewis has won a court battle with an author who claimed the retailer had copied one of her designs in an advert. The Tavartment store Christmas advert in 2019 featured a fire-breathing but friendly green dragon named Edgar. Faye Evans from Macclesfield, Cheshire claimed Edgar bore a striking resemblance to a character Fred the Fire Sneezing Dragon. When a high court judge ruled on Monday there was no evidence the team behind the advert had been aware of her work. The commercial first aired in November 2019, after which Miss Evans suggested on social media that it had been copied from her own story. The self-published children's 
author sued John Lewis as well as Adam and Eve, DDB, the creative agency behind the ad. At a hearing in January, John Lewis and the agency disputed the claim, arguing that there were numerous and substantial differences between Miss Evans' book and the advert. The retail chain said nobody involved in making the advert or a spin-off book titled Excitable Edgar had been aware of Fred the Fire Sneezing Dragon. The two companies also argued that the ad was based on a concept that was first pitched to John Lewis in 2016 before being chosen in 2019. Miss Evans' illustrated book was published in 2017. Both stories involved friendly dragons who struggle to fit in due to their fire-breathing abilities. In the John Lewis advert, Excitable Edgar is seen accidentally melting a child snowman, setting fire to Christmas decorations and burning through an ice rink, creating a hole. In Miss Evans' story, Fred struggles to control his fire-breathing at school, but is later encouraged to use his power to cook meals for fellow pupils. Lawyers for Miss Evans accepted the advert was drawn up a year before her book was published, argued that other elements not featured in the 2016 outline had breached her copyright regardless. The court heard that only 914 copies of Fred the Fire Sneezing Dragon had been sold up to October 31st, 2019, with more than 700 of those coming out of primary school visits. However, Miss Justice Clark said there was not a scrap of evidence John Lewis or the agency had seen Miss Evans' story before the legal battle started. While the judge accepted both stories focused on a friendly dragon which finds it difficult to control its fire, she ruled these are entirely commonplace features, almost ubiquitous in depictions of dragons. The similarities between Fred the Fire Sneezing Dragon on the one hand and Excitable Edgar are few in number and can easily be explained by coincidence rather than copying. She added that there can be no copying if the work alleged to have been copied has not been accessed, seen in this case by those said to have copied it. I am satisfied on the balance of probabilities that there has been no copy. Miss Justice Clark ordered Miss Evans to publish the outcome on her website, which the writer had previously used to publicise the route. A spokesman for John Lewis and Adam and Eve, DDB, said, We take great pride and care in our Christmas advert and are glad that the judge recognised the originality of Excitable Edgar. We are pleased that the matter is now resolved after the court found there was no copyright infringement. Modern the ruling of Miss Evans said, From today, I'm looking forward to writing more original stories for children and developing Fred the Musical, ready for its premiere in July 2023 at the Liverpool Theatre Festival. Wet wipes containing plastic will be banned in England under plans to tackle water pollution, Environment Minister Therese Coffey has told BBC News. The ban on plastic-based wipes should come into force in the next year following a consultation. It is part of a wider plan to improve water quality in England, where no river or waterway is considered clean. But opposition and environmental groups criticised the plan as weak. Wet wipes flushed down the toilets caused 93% of sewer blockages, including a soap called Batbergs, that cost around £100 million a year to clear up, according to Water UK, which represents the water industry. Around 90% of wipes contained plastic in 2021, although there are now some alternatives available to buy. The plastics do not break down and over time, the wipes become snagged and stick together, causing sewage to stop moving through pipes. Our proposal is to ban plastic from wet wipes, Miss Copy told BBC News, adding that a short consultation needed to take place first. It's a legal requirement to make sure that we can go ahead with any ban. The government first said in 2018 that it planned to eliminate plastic waste, including wet wipes. In a 2021 government consultation on burning wet wipes, 96% of people said they supported the idea. Earlier this year, the government had decided against banning wet wipes following another consultation. In Wales, a proposed ban on plastic in wet wipes has not yet been implemented. The Scottish government consulted on a ban but has not taken further action. Some companies, including Boots and Tesco, have already stopped the sale of wet wipes, which contain plastic from their shops. The wet wipes ban is part of a broader strategy called Plan for Water, which the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, DEFRA, wants to improve England's water quality. It includes a potential ban on some types of so-called forever chemicals or PFAS, tackling pollution from farming and runoff from road traffic. Pollution from intensive farming, in particular from chicken farms, is the most common way rivers are being contaminated, according to a parliamentary report from 2022. The government announced on Sunday that water companies could face unlimited fines for releasing untreated sewage into rivers and seas without good reason. Figures show an average of 825 sewage spills per day into England's waterways in the last year. But environment charity River Action UK said the government had been asleep at the wheel for many years and had allowed rivers to fill up with untreated human effluent and toxic agricultural pollution. How can DEFRA credibly announce stronger regulation and tougher enforcement when there is not won a single commitment today by government to put its money where its mouth is and properly refund its statutory environmental protection ag agencies, CEO Charles Watson said. Water companies who spend millions of pounds clearing up blockages caused by wet wipes are in favour of a ban. In Yorkshire, wipes are the biggest cause of blockages and caused almost half of them in 2022, according to Yorkshire Water, which told BBC News it welcomed the proposed ban. Opposition political 
political parties criticise the government's plans, calling them too little too late. This announcement is nothing more than a shuffling of the deck chairs and a reheating of old failed measures that simply give the green light for sewage dumping to continue for decades to come, said Jim McMahon, MP Labour's Shadow Environment Secretary. This is the third sham of the Tory water plan since the summer. There's nothing in it that tells us how, if or when they will end the Tory sewage scandal. Liberal Democrat Environment spokesperson Tim Farron called the announcement a complete farce. Yet again, the Conservative government is taking the public for fools by re-announcing a wet white policy from five years ago. The government is all talk and no action. The Green Party said the government plans leave the water industry in private hands, able to profit from failure. The Green Party wants to see system change with our water supply brought back into public ownership at the earliest practical opportunity, said a Green Party co-leader Adrian Ramsey. Italy has become the first Western country to block and bolt chatbot chat GPT. The Italian Data Protection Authority said there were privacy concerns relating to the model, which was created by US startup OpenAI and is backed by Microsoft. The regulator said it would ban and investigate OpenAI with immediate effect. OpenAI told the BBC it complied with privacy laws. Millions of people have used chat GPT since it launched in November 2022. It can answer questions using natural human-like language, and it can also mimic other writing styles using the internet as it was in 2021 as its database. Microsoft has spent billions of dollars on it, and it was added to Bing last month. It has also said it will embed a version of the technology in its Office apps, including Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Outlook. There have been concerns over the potential risks of artificial intelligence, including its threat to jobs and the spreading of misinformation and bias. Earlier this week, key figures in tech, including Elon Musk, called for these types of AI systems to be suspended amid fears the race to develop them was out of control. The Italian watchdog said that not only would it block OpenAI's chatbot, but it would also investigate whether it complied with general data protection regulations. DTPR governs the way in which we can use, process, and store personal data. The watchdog said on the 20th of March that the app had experienced a data breach involved using conversations and payment information. It said there was no legal basis to justify the mass collection and storage of personal data for the purpose of training the algorithms other than underlying the operation of the platform. It also said that since there was no way to verify the age of users, the app exposes minors to absolutely unsuitable answers compared to their degree of development and awareness. Bard, Google's rival artificial intelligence chatbot is now available but only to specified users over the age of 18 because of those same concerns. The Italian Data Protection Authority said OpenAI had 20 days to say how it would address the watchdog's concerns under the penalty of a fine of 20 million euros or 21.7 million dollars, or up to 4% of annual revenues. Elsewhere, the Irish Data Protection Commission told the BBC it's following up with the Italian regulator to understand the basis for their action and will coordinate with all EU data protection authorities in connection to the ban. The Information Commissioner's Office, the UK's independent data regulator, told the BBC it would support developments in AI, but that it was ready to challenge non-compliance with data protection laws. Dan Morgan from cybersecurity ratings provider Security Scorecard said that the ban shows the importance of regulatory compliance for companies operating in Europe. Businesses must prioritise protection of personal data and comply with the stringent data protection regulations set by the EU. Compliance with regulations is not an optional extra. Consumer advocacy group BEUC also called on EU and national authorities, including data protection watch dogs to investigate chat GPT and similar chat box following the filing of a complaint in the US. Although the EU is currently working on the world's first legislation on AI, BEUC's concern is that it would take years before the AI Act could take effect, leaving consumers at risk of harm from a technology that is not sufficiently regulated. Ursula Pack, Deputy Director General of BEUC, warned that society was currently not protected, protected enough from the harm that AI can cause. There are serious concerns growing about how chat GPT and similar chatbots might deceive and manipulate people. These AI systems need greater public scrutiny and public authorities must reassert control over them, she said. ChatGPT is already blocked in a number of countries, including China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia. OpenAI told the BBC that it had disabled ChatGPT for users in Italy at the request of the Italian data protection regulator called the Garante. We are committed to protecting people's privacy and we believe we comply with GDP, R, and other privacy laws, it wrote. The organization organization said it worked to reduce personal data in training AI systems like ChatGPT because it wanted its AI systems to learn about the world, not about private individuals. We also believe that AI regulation is necessary, so we look forward to working closely with the guarantee and educating them on how our systems are built and used, it added. OpenAI said it looked forward to making ChatGPT available in Italy again soon. The father of a cyclist killed by a driver who failed to brake or swerve before the fatal crash said the decision to spend
their him jail was a farce. Tony Jones said his family's lives were torn apart when his son, David, aged 41, was killed in Bridgend in May 2020. Raymond Trahan, aged 74, was given a nine-month suspended sentence and a seven-year driving ban for causing his death by careless driving last month. The Ministry of Justice said independent judges decided sentences. We know the devastation wrecked by those who caused death on our roads, which is why we have increased the maximum penalty for the worst offences to life behind bars, a spokesman added. Charity Cycling UK said Trahan should have been convicted of causing death by dangerous driving rather than careless driving and called it symptomatic of the UK's broken road traffic laws. The court was told if Trahan had been paying attention, he would have seen the father of two on his bike for at least seven seconds before hitting him. I couldn't believe what I was hearing, said David's father, Tony. Seven seconds is a long time when you think about it. It's long enough to react and obviously he didn't. Speaking in his living room in Pencode, Bridgend County, Tony said the first he knew something was wrong was when he called his son and the police officer answered. He said, Davey had been in an accident. I said, is he all right? And he said, I'm 99% sure he's dead. I came in here and told the wife and it was chaos here. She couldn't believe it. She just broke down and she's still the same now. He said the whole family were in complete disbelief. The night before he was here having a steak and chips with us for his tea and that's the last time we saw him. On the 29th of May 2020, David, who has children aged 10 and 7, set off for an early morning bike ride as he did before work most days. He was an experienced cyclist and was very familiar with the road he was cycling a lot. Tony, a retired coach driver, said the court case was particularly hard because he knows Trahan and used to work with him. If he had come over and said, I'm sorry, it wouldn't have made any difference about bringing Davy back, but he would have shown a bit of remorse, but there was nothing at all. Mr. Jones added, I couldn't believe he just walked. He said the sentence was a real farce and I felt the judge was too lenient. Trahan of Kenvig Hill has been approached for comment. Driving a car is like having a knife in your hand. It's a dangerous weapon and if you kill somebody, you should get made to pay for it. He just hasn't. He's walked away free. He said his barrister advised the family that an appeal would be unlikely to be successful because Trahan was sentenced within the sentencing guidelines for causing death by careless driving. Andrew Taylor, a criminal barrister based at Apex Chambers in Cardiff, agrees. He said, I suspect because Raymond Trahan had an impeccable driving record, he'd driven professionally for many years. There was no evidence of any drinks or drugs involved. There was no evidence that the vehicle was other than properly on the road with tax, MOT, insured and all the things we expect of a driver and therefore she, Judge Catherine Richards, decided to draw back from sending him to immediate custody and she imposed a suspended sentence. The maximum sentence for causing death by careless driving is five years, whereas causing death by dangerous driving carries a maximum of life in prison. Mr. Taylor added, this is a case where a person behind a wheel with devastating consequences sadly doesn't keep a proper look out as we all have to do when we get behind the wheel of the vehicle. That of course cost the deceased his life, which is tragic, but there is nothing the learned judge did not take into account, which should have been properly taken into account. Cycling UK's campaigners manager Keir Gallagher believes the case demonstrates why the law needs to be reviewed. Failing to spot another road user for almost 10 seconds before crashing into and killing them is clearly a dangerous act. Yet our broken road traffic laws mean Raymond Trahan was merely charged with causing death by careless driving, he said. The Westminster government promised to review these failing laws in 2014, but we're still waiting and the price of delay is sadly paid again and again by families that, like that of David Jones. He urged the government to commit to its long overdue comprehensive review to bring consistency to our road traffic laws and keep responsible cyclists, pedestrians and drivers safe. Tony said he wanted to speak out for others going through the same thing and although he disagrees with the suspended sentence, he does not intend to appeal against it. It's not going to fetch him back, he said. He'll always be a memory and he'll always be in the heart but is something you will never ever get over. You should never ever bury your kids. Frail and vulnerable people will go without the care they need, council chiefs are warning. After ministers in England set out funding plans for care, a decision to hold back half of £500 million pounds to promise to help plug staff shortages has been criticised by adult social care directors. They said the government's commitment to supporting adults with disabilities and the elderly was in tatters. It came after ministers unveiled £2 billion pounds of grants for the next two years. A total of £600 million pounds has been held back by the Department of Health and Social Care, however. Some £250 million pounds of it came from the £500 million pounds originally promised last year to support the workforce measures such as extra training places. About 1 in 10 posts are vacant with staff in shortages rising by more than 50% in the past year. There are currently more than 500,000 people waiting for care. Sarah McClinton, the president of the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services, said this plan leaves the government's vision in tatters. It dumps the hard decision and kicks the can down the road until after the next election. Adult social care is in crisis. Now's not the time to be holding funding back. Many more people won't get the quality care and support 
support they need, forcing more family and friends to step in where they can, more people deteriorating and being admitted to hospital, and further damage to the NHS and economy. How many people work in adult social care in England? In 2022, there were 1.5 million people working in adult social care. About 400,000 people left their jobs, which is more than a quarter of the workforce. There were 165,000 vacancies, a 52% increase on the previous year, and the highest on record. Care workers were paid an average hourly rate of £9.66 in the independent sector and £11.03 in the public sector. The funding which was first announced last year includes money for digital social care records, home adaptations and for councils to pay for care places. Most care is provided by private and voluntary sector organisations. But the £2 billion of investment is just a fraction of what is normally spent on social care. Grants from the Department of Health and Social Care represent just one funding stream. Councils rely on alongside others such as other central government grants, council tax and business rates. In the past year, more than £20 billion was spent on care services. Over the past 10 years, councils have had to reduce the amount they spend on social care once inflation and the rising demand from the ageing population is taken into account. According to the Health Foundation, because of the squeeze on their overall funding, Caroline Abrahams, co-chair of the Care and Support Alliance, which represents more than 70 charities and charity directors of Age UK, said the measures announced aren't remotely enough to transform social care. Millions of older and disabled people and their carers needed something far bigger, bolder and more generally strategic to give them hope for the future. She continued with quite a chunk of the money originally promised to poor care now no longer available. Our members are telling us this is just the latest in a long series of disappointments so far as recent government performance on social care is concerned. The government said the £600 million being held back would still be invested in social care but it's now assessing where best to invest it in the system. But Health Minister Helen Watley said the investment would make a difference. This package of reforms focuses on recognising care with the status it deserves while also focusing on the better use of technology, the power of data and digital care care records and extra funding for councils, aiming to make a care system we can be proud of. Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer has called a government announcement on social care funding a betrayal. He said that ministers had promised a lot but delivered almost nothing. We need to get to grips with vacancies in the workforce. Lib Dem leader Ed Davey said a slashing of social care funding was a disaster and that elderly people and people with disabilities were going to be the victims. US President Joe Biden will begin a four-day trip to Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland in Belfast on the 11th of April. The White House has confirmed Confirmed. President Biden will begin his trip in Belfast to mark the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. He will also hold various engagements, including in Dublin, County Louth, and County Mayo. The president is also expected to meet Irish President Michael D. Higgins. In a statement, the White House said the president will travel to the United Kingdom and Ireland from the April 11th to the 14th, adding that the trip would mark the tremendous progress since the signing of the Belfast and Good Friday Agreement 25 years ago. Tal Sikh Irish Prime Minister Leo Varadkar said he was delighted that President Biden would be visiting Ireland. When we spoke recently in the White House, President Biden was clear that in celebrating the Good Friday Agreement, we should be looking ahead, not backwards. He said the involvement of the United States and of President Biden personally had been essential to the peace process in Ireland. From its earnest uncertain beginnings to the making of the Good Friday Agreement in good days and bad, the US has always been at our side, said Mr. Bradker. So it's fitting that President Biden will be here to mark this significant milestone with us. In 2016, Joe Biden visited the Republic of Ireland during his time as Vice President and went on a tour of his ancestral home in County Mayo. Last week, the President said he still planned to visit Northern Ireland despite MI5's decision to increase the terrorism threat level to severe. During the next week's visit, the President will hold various engagements in the Republic of Ireland, including those in Dublin, County Loth and County Mayo, where he will deliver an address to celebrate the deep historic ties that link our countries and people. Former US President Bill Clinton, former UK Prime Minister Tony Blair and former Taoiseach Bertie Ahern are among those expected to visit Northern Ireland for commemorative events. Both Queen's University Belfast and Ulster University are hosting events to mark the anniversary. Large silent video portraits of the 14 politicians who negotiated the peace deal will be displayed at UU's Belfast campus from the 15th to the 20th of April. The university is also launching a new leadership program, a tourism summit and an, ed an education project. Further details of the President Biden's trip have yet to be released. Martha Lane Fox has warned against becoming too historical or hype driven over artificial intelligence. The tech pioneer instead urges more sensible conversations around its capabilities. She told the BBC she thinks there should be frameworks in place around AI, but that companies should also think carefully about how they use it. Concerns have been mounting that AI is not sufficiently regulated. AI is technology that allows a computer to think or act in a more human way. Examples include the voice assistants like Siri and Alexa and the chatbot ChatGBT. Since ChatGBT 
was launched in November last year. Millions of people have enjoyed experimenting with it and its popularity has been growing. GBT4 is the latest in a series of AIs, which the firm refers to as GPTs, an acronym which stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. But as a result of that pace, tech leaders, including Elon Musk, have raised fears of a threat to humanity and there have been calls for AI to be shut down. Last week, Italy became the first Western country to block chat GPT. Although Lane Fox admits there are some genuine anxieties around the tech and that there might be some job losses along the way, she says she thinks we should embrace the opportunities it presents in a balanced manner. I think that having a rational and reasonable conversation is the most important thing and not becoming it too hysterical or hype driven, but looking more carefully at what is actually happening and how we can miscate the risks and double down on the opportunities, she said. In 1998, Lane Fox co-founded LastMinute.com, an online travel agency that was briefly seen as Britain's answer to Amazon. Since then, there's she's been one of the strongest voices in the UK tech scene. It is clear that she's an enthusiast about the digital future now as she was during the dot-com boom and that she has a handle on how AI is still in very early iteration. There's no point in sitting here saying AI going to destroy the world. Well, it's happening, right? Technology isn't slowing down. It's speeding up with digitization. So we have to decide whether we're going to digitize in a way that is ethical, that is inclusive, that is sustainable. She's also adamant that the more diversity you get around the table when legislating for future technologies, the better women, minorities, you know, people that don't normally get access to this stuff. Martha Lane Fox is a champion for equality and parity across the tech sector, something she says she is disappointed to see unchanged for women since she was breaking into the scene in the 1990s. She says that she is totally horrified at the situation, adding that there is a higher percentage of women in the House of Lords where she is a my peer than there is working in technology. In March 2013, Lane Fox became the Lord's youngest female member at the age of 40. The appointment saw her gain the title of Baroness Lane Fox of Soho in the city of Westminster. Since then, she has served successive governments as a digital advisor and founded businesses such as karaoke chain Lucky Voice. Most recently, she has become the president of the British Chambers of Commerce. Up until Elon Musk took over Twitter in October 2022, Lane Fox had been on the board of the platform as a non-executive director. She was integral to the business decisions that were made during the legal tussle between Mr. Musk and Twitter as the controversial sale went through. Her first response to the questions around what it was like during that period was simply exhausting. I'm still kind of winding down from that experience, she says. I feel unbelievably lucky to have had a front row seat to one of the most extraordinary corporate events over the last decade. Lane Fox said the priorities that she and the other director had were always what was best for the Twitter shareholders, regardless of the frenzy around Mr. Musk. Elon offered an amazing price to the company and it was clear to the shareholders that we had to sell the company. When probed on what the billionaire was like to deal with, she says, you have to put your kind of personal beliefs aside. Lane Fox thinks it is too early to tell what Mr. Musk's impact on Twitter will be, but anticipates it will be interesting. Along with paid verification, since taking over the platform, Mr. Musk has brought in a TikTok style for you feed of a recommended posts, a focus on freedom of speech, but not freedom of reach, and silver and gold tips for governments and brands. The product cycle at Twitter can definitely keep improving and already things have changed, some good, some bad. I wouldn't underestimate either Elon or Twitter. The earliest known full recording of the Beatles playing a live concert in the UK, at the point they were becoming the biggest band in the nation, has been revealed by BBC Radio 4's Front Row almost exactly 60 years after it was made. The hour-long quarter-inch tape recording was made by 15-year-old John Bloomfield at Stowe Boarding School in Buckinghamshire on the 4th of April 1963, when the band played a concert at the school's theatre. They had been booked by fellow pupil David Moores, who had written to manager Brian Epstein. Epstein perhaps recognising the connection to an important Liverpool family, the Moores family owned the Littlewoods football pools and retail business, agreed to the booking for a fee of £100, and Moores raised the funds by selling tickets to schoolmates. Bloomfield was a self-confessed tech geek keen to try out a new reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Now in his 70s, he revealed the existence of the tape and they went to Stowe to make a front row special about the 60th anniversary of the concert. It was a unique Beatles gig formed in front of an almost entirely male audience. And crucially, despite loud cheers and some screaming, the tape is not drowned out by the audience reaction. It captures the appeal of the Beatles' tightly honed live act with a mixture of their clunk repertoire of R&B covers and the start of the Lennon-McCartney song 
songwriting partnership with the tracks of their debut album Please Please Me, which had been released barely two weeks earlier on the 22nd of March. They kicked off with the album's opening track. I saw her standing there and then segued into Chuck Berry's Too Much Monkey Business. Beatles historian Mark Lewisum and I, the only people have heard the full recording after Bloomfield agreed to play it for the first time since the recording was made. Part of it was played on front row on Monday 3rd of April. Speaking about its significance, Lewisum said the opportunity that this tape represents, which is completely out of blue, is fantastic because we hear them just on the cusp of the breakthrough into complete world fame. And at that point, all audience recordings become blanketed in screams. So here is an opportunity to hear them in the UK in an environment where they could be heard and where the tape actually does capture them properly at a time where they can have banter with the audience as well. I think it's an incredibly important recording and I hope something good and constructive and creative eventually happens to it. I didn't even know this tape existed until they told them about it and I think they had to pick themselves off the floor. The band arrived late from a recording at the BBC Paris studios and used to playing two and a half hour sets rattled through more than 22 songs in an hour. Remarkably they are heard taking requests from the schoolboys who shouted out the names of songs that had been released just two weeks earlier. The banter between the band and audience reveals Sir John Lennon doing jokes, voices, the huge popularity of Ringo Starr and the fact that George Harrison had lost his voice and was unable to sing. Bloomfield said that the show made a big impact on him. They would say I grew up at that very instant he said. It sounds a bit of an exaggeration but they realised this was something from a different planet. Although Stowe was a boys school at the time some girls were watching the Fab Four from the back. It wasn't until they started playing that they heard them screaming and they realised they were in the middle of Beatlemania Bloomfield said. It was just something they never even vaguely experienced. Afterwards the band were taken for a meal in a tuck shop and were shown at Bloomfield's typical Spartan dorm room. In 2020 when the school put up a blue plaque to celebrate the Beatles visit Sir Paul McCartney recalled how shocked they'd been. Good old working class boys like us have never visited an establishment like Stowe and we were shocked to see the stark living conditions. Bloomfield has kept the recording for all these years but had never publicly revealed its existence until then. Visiting the school theatre again he said he was embarrassed to have made the tape but seeing the Beatles had changed his life and he found it emotional listening to it again 60 years on. Ministers will consider advice from the Human Rights Watch dog about amending a legal definition of sex which would make it easier to exclude transgender people from some groups or services. Changing the Equality Act term to biological sex would make single sex services offers easier says the EHRC Equality and Human Rights Commission. LGBTQ plus charity Stonewall said it risks adding to a manufactured culture war. The EHRC said it would give clarity in a polarised and contentious area. A person's sex is recorded on their birth certificate when they are born. People who are transgender can apply for a gender Recognition Certificate, GRC, which changes their legal sex on documents such as their birth certificate, marriage certificate, and eventually their death certificate. If the law was amended, it could mean that those who have done so would no longer be classed as the new sex listed on these documents for the purposes of the Act, which was designed to protect people from discrimination. For example, if a transgender woman had updated her birth certificate so that the sex listed was female, under the suggested changes to the Equality Act, her sex would still be classified as male and she would be restricted from entering women only spaces by default. Last year the EHRC provided guidance for when spaces could exclude transgender people from single sex areas but only if it was considered a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim, for example privacy or safety. Last year there were 500 GRCs issued in Great Britain and more than 7,000 have been issued since 2004. In February the Women and Equalities Minister Kemi Badenoch wrote to the EHRC asking for advice about amending the Equalities Act's definition of sex. In her response Baroness Volker said redefining sex as biological sex merited further consideration in an area that she described as polarised and contentious. She said it would make it simpler for some settings such as a women-only hospital ward to be a space for biological women and exclude trans women whether or not they had a GRC changing their legal sex. Other examples she gave included sports groups and lesbian and gay associations. She specified how a lesbian support group currently may have to admit a trans woman with a GRC but if the Equality Act was amended the group could restrict membership to biological women only. However, Baroness Faulkner acknowledged that a change could be more ambiguous than the current definition of sex in relation to equal pay and sex discrimination. She said any changes to the law would need detailed analysis of possible disadvantages for trans men and women in these areas. There are nine protected characteristics in the Equality Act, such as sex, gender, reassignment and religion. The role of the EHRC is to provide guidance and enforce the law to protect against discrimination. Campaign groups and LGBT charities are divided over the intervention. Sex matters which previously set up a petition calling
Stonewalling for a clarification of the Equality Act, has welcomed the advice and described it as measured and thoughtful. Stonewall, however, says there is no evidence it is needed and risks opening what it has called yet another chapter in a manufactured culture war. A government spokesperson says it has received the advice and will consider it.